Good evening, everyone. Hi, I'm Pastor Kenneth Gooden, pastor of the New Covenant Missionary Baptist Church here in Clarksdale, Mississippi. And we're so glad that you've come to be a part of our broadcast, our midweek Bible study broadcast. And we're so thankful that you can tune in and be a part of what we're trying to do for the Lord. Brothers and sisters, it's always a blessing when we're able to discuss the word of the Lord, learn from the word of the Lord, but more importantly, grow from the word of the Lord. And what I like so much about this uh, midweek service is that not only are we discussing the word of God, but we're also having prayer, corporate prayer. And I know that you may not be here uh, in the sanctuary with me. I, I know you may be at home or wherever you are right now. But I want you to know that when we pray, let's pray together. So whatever you have going on in your life, whatever problems you have, whatever situations that you're trying to work through, that, that thing that has come up against you so much, I want you to know that you serve a God today that's able to hear and answer prayer. And God does not want you to take that that continue to carry that burden by yourself. He wants you to leave it right here. I want everybody who's a part of this prayer meeting to leave all your problems, all your cares, all your concerns, and have faith that whenever in due season, God is going to move on your behalf. We just believe that today. And I believe that there's power in prayer. I believe not only is there power in prayer, but there's power when God's people come together and pray. If you read the scripture, whenever the people of God came together and you was united in prayer, there was things that came about. God moved on their behalf. He heard their cries. He, he made a way out of no way because the people of God was praying. And I'm just believing right now that no matter what we're dealing with right now, something's got to give. Why? Because the people of God are praying. My Lord, so let us prepare to have a word of prayer, my Lord. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for this day. For this is the day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Father God, we come to you humble, Lord God. We, we understand, Lord God, that you are everything, Lord God. It's not about us, but it's all about you. So I pray right now, Lord God, that your will shall be done. And right now, Lord God, we give you the glory for who you are, Lord God. We, we thank you for your love. We, we thank you for your faithfulness, O oh Heavenly Father. We, we're thankful, Lord God, that somehow you can use imperfect people, Lord God. People with issues. People that have work to do, Lord God. That somehow, even though the world might discard people like that, you can look down and see the value in them, Lord. And I'm thankful, Lord God. We are all thankful. That somehow you see the value in us, O oh Heavenly Father. And right now, O oh Lord God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we continue to give you thanks for your mercies and your grace. But Lord, we also need you right now, Lord God. We're praying to you right now in the name of Jesus that you will hear and answer prayer. We're praying to you right now for those that just need for you to do something in their lives, Lord. People are going through some things, Lord, that many times we don't always know what people are going through. I know all of us are dealing with the effects of this COVID-19, but it runs much deeper than that, Lord God. Some people have personal issues that they're going through. Some people are dealing with relationship issues that they're going through, Lord God. Some people are just looking for you to move right now. There, there's a need in the household. There's, there's a need for the family, Lord God. And they want you to show up and be the provider that you are. Lord, you're able to do that and more. Not only is there no failure in our God, but there is literally nothing our God cannot do. And Lord God, I pray we have the, the walk of faith in our lives, Lord. We don't just want to call to you out in prayer, but we want to, we want to have faith to believe that you're already working. It does not matter right now, Lord. It does not matter that we don't see it, Lord God, that, that the visual part has not manifested itself right now. We know that you're God. You've already shown to us you're able. You've already shown to us, Lord God, that you love us. You've already shown that you care. And we're not going to start doubting you right now, Lord God, because you've already brought us thus far by faith. Continue to keep us on, Lord God, to continue to move us forward, to push us even more, Lord God. Lord, we live by faith today. We live by faith, Lord God, that you will bring an end, our resolve to this situation with this virus. We live by faith, Lord God, 
that you, Lord God, give people what their needs, that there be no lack in the household, Lord God, that people are blessed and they're going in and coming out, Lord God, that our cup is literally running over right now in the name of Jesus. Glory, hallelujah. Lord God, we believe by faith that you're healing those who are sick right now, Lord God. We believe what the word says, what it says, and the prayer of faith shall heal the sick, Lord God. There is sickness in the land, but yet you continue to be a healer. And Father, I pray right now, Lord God, Lord God, that the, the servant part of us, I mention service all the time, Lord God, because, Lord God, you've called us to be servants. But more importantly, even though you were the son of the living God, you came here to serve, Lord God. You came here to bless, oh, Heavenly Father. You set the example for us. Help us to be servants, Lord God, for our brother and our sister. And there are some things that work against us, Lord. There's hate, Lord God. There's enmity between brother and, and, and sister, brother and brother, Lord God. We pray right now, Lord God, that no weapon formed against your people shall prosper in the name of Jesus. We pray that as believers, Lord God, we understand who you are in our lives. The fact, Lord God, that not only do you have all power in your hands, but more importantly, you have more power than the enemy has. And if the God we serve that protects us, that keeps us, Lord, that, that, that shields us, Lord God, under your wings, Lord God, that, that provides a, a way of escape, that you, O oh Heavenly Father, because you are all that great, Lord God, why should we worry about the enemy? Why should we fret? Lord God, work on us. We thank you for all that you've done right now. We're praying to you about the things that we need. But right now, Lord God, work on us. Have your way in our lives today, Lord God. We, we want to get closer to you, Lord. We, we're thankful for who you are. We're thankful for all of your blessings, Lord God. But we want to know you, Lord God, and get closer to you even more than we did before, Lord. Grow us spiritually, Lord God. I pray that, Lord God, as we are waiting, as we have been in our houses, Lord God, that, Lord God, you're building us up. That we're not just sitting around, Lord God, but something is happening, Lord God. Something spiritual and wonderful is happening right now in the name of Jesus, Lord God. We pray right now that, Lord God, we'll come out, Lord God, with strength, with a purpose and a zeal, Lord God, to want to do your will. I pray for every need right now, Lord God, of the believers here today. I pray not only for the, the, the members, Lord God, of this church, but all believers, Lord God. For all of us are one body in Christ, Lord God. Move right now in the name of Jesus. Encourage our hearts. Let us not grow weary about what we see, about what we face, Lord God. For we know that you are an able God. And we just want to thank you right now, Lord God. We want to lift up the name of Jesus, Lord God. It is something about that name. Healing is in the name of Jesus, Lord God. Restoration is in the name of Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus, Lord. And we thank you right now. We thank you for who you are in our lives. Bless us, Lord God. Bless this message, Lord God. Bless this Bible study. I pray that more importantly, we are led of you in all that we do, that the you crucify the flesh in us, Lord God, that our minds are on you, Lord. And Lord, I, God, I pray right now that your will shall come to pass through this Bible study. What I mean, Lord God, is whatever you desire, whatever you desire, Lord God, for us to get out of this, this biblical lesson, we pray that it shall come to pass right now in the name of Jesus, that we grow because of your word. That, Lord God, we are strengthened because of your word. That your word is hidden in our hearts that we may not sin against you. We just want to thank you right now, Lord God. And, Lord God, out of all the things that work against us to, Lord God, to cause separation between us. Lord God, unite us. And the only way that we can be united is that we focus on Jesus Christ. Let our minds be stayed on you, O oh Lord. Help us to have thoughts that are pure that are lovely, Lord God. Help us, Lord God, to consider you in all that we do, but more importantly, let us be led of you. We thank you right now. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. God is good all the time, brothers and sisters, and all the time, God is good. And again, like I always say during this midweek broadcast, I thank God for answered prayer. But, brother preacher, I don't think it's been answered. That's all right. I'm believing 
that God is going to answer our prayer. My Lord, brothers and sisters, I feel that God has truly given us something really good for this midweek Bible study. Uh, it's something that we you have discussed, I'm sure, before, but I want us to really turn to Matthew, the seventh chapter, and, and we'll really start around the 13th verse. My Lord, there'll be other passages of scripture that we'll look at too outside of Matthew, not too many, uh, but we will look at some. And the title of this Bible study is Which Way Will You Go, My Lord? Now, if you remember, uh, this passage of scripture really talks about the two gates. One is a narrow gate. One is the broad gate. And if you can remember, and we'll get ready to read it in a few minutes, God speaks about that broad gate as the one that most people go down. But that's not the one that really leads to eternal life. It's the narrow gate. The one, the gate that really fewer people are going through. He describes that as being the gate that really leads to eternal life. But, but there's a certain responsibility to try to get through that gate. There's some important things, you know, if you say, I'm going to be one to walk through that narrow gate and avoid the, the broad gate. There's some things that that really Christ spoke of, praise the Lord, right here in his word that really, really uh, uh, could be a blessing unto all of us. And we really want to get into that. So, again, I want you to turn to Matthew, the seventh chapter, and we'll read the first two verses in verse 13 and 14. Now, this identifies uh, the two gates and we'll we'll do that. All right. Verse 13 reads as follows. It says, enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, my Lord. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it, my Lord, my Lord. So, so now it identifies what these two gates are. It describes one gate as being the narrow gate. And then one other gate it describes as, as being the, the, the wide or the broad gate. And, and it basically lets us know it's that wide or broad gate is the one that many people actually find themselves going through and, and not the narrow gate. And then it kind of gave some distinction uh, between the two. First of all, it characterized that wide gate or, or that narrow gate as being the, I should say that broad gate or the wide gate, as being that gate that actually leads to destruction. It's the gate that if you get there and you're thinking it's going to lead you to what you want, which is truly eternal life or to be with God in glory, praise the Lord, that broad gate isn't the one that take you there. And what Christ really describes is he describes that gate as being the one that most people are trying to get to. Most people are going down right now. You know, sometimes, brothers and sisters, uh, we do things because what other people do. And Christ is saying that there's going to be a lot of people that travel that gate. But that's not the gate you need to be looking for. Not the gate that leads to destruction, but the narrow gate that leads to eternal life. My Lord. And so that's very important that he identifies these two gates. And more importantly, he identifies uh, 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 the traffic, so to speak. In these two gates, one that is busy, the one that actually doesn't lead uh, to a relationship with God, or I should say lead to eternal glory with God. And then the one that's narrow, that has fewer people going through. And that is the gate that leads you to eternal life in glory with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, if, if you think about it and, and you look at what he describes and how each one ha has an ending to him and how different those endings are. You would probably assume, even after reading this, even after having an understanding of these two gates, that the one that is the narrow gate that leads into eternal life, that that will be the one that everybody's trying to get through the clamor to. But yet it describes the one that is wide and broad, the one that leads to destruction as being the one that actually has the most traffic, that actually has the, the, the more people trying to get through. Why is that? How, how can I look at that? Even hear what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has said, what the Lord has said, and, and, and know that he said that this is the gate that leads to destruction, but yet it continues to have more people in it, or more people trying to have access to it, than the one that leads to eternal life. How, how can this be? Well, there's a couple of things you need to understand, three, really three things you need to understand. And they are three characteristics of this narrow gate. 
the one that leads to eternal life. If you, if you look at it, what it says in verse 13 and 14, it gives us about three characteristics of that narrow gate. The first thing it says, watch this, it is difficult. It said it right here, beginning part of verse 14, because a narrow gate and difficult is the way that leads to life. So, so this way right here is difficult to get through. Why? Because it requires some things. It, it requires sacrifice. It requires commitment. It, it, it requires a life change to go through this gate while the other gate does not require that. Don't you know that any gate that leads to destruction is not really going to require you to do anything. Matter of fact, that's probably going to be the fun direction. But that direction is going to lead you to destruction. So, so this way right here that God wants us to focus on, watch this. He's already said through his word right here, that's the difficult gate to go through. Now, when I hear that, brothers and sisters, to me, that shows how great our God is. Listen to what I'm saying right now. He's an all powerful God who created man. And not only did he create man and design man, but he knows man. He knows us and he empathizes with us. He said, look, I, I know this is not going to be an easy journey for you. It's going to be downright hard. Sometimes you're going to fail sometime trying to get through this gate. There's going to be moments where you mess up trying to get through this narrow gate. But he says to hold on in there to keep striving to get through the narrow gate because whatever, watch this, whatever work that you have to do to get through that narrow gate, as tough as it may seem, it does not compare, like the word says, to the glory that shall be revealed in us when we get to the other side of glory. In other words, as tough as life is right now, it cannot compare to what God has in store for us. My Lord, that's the blessing of our God. So brothers and sisters, God has already said this gate is difficult and it would explain why folks try to go through the other gate. We want it easy. We want it simple. We want the one that really requires the less work. So that's why the broad gate has so much traffic. But God said, if you're going to go through this gate, the narrow gate is difficult and you're going to have to work. Not only that, though, but he makes it plain and clear. And here's the caveat to continue to try to do what thus says the Lord. This one over here, the narrow gate leads to eternal life. One leads to death and one leads to life. And it's the life part, brothers and sisters, that all of us should have the strength or I should say the energy or, or, or to let that be our motivating factor of why we're trying to get through the narrow gate in the first place. Why am I going trying so hard to live a life that pleases God? Why am I'm trying to be what I believe God has called me to be? Why am I'm trying to give up some things that that can stand between me and my relationship with the Lord? Why am I trying so hard? Because I want life. Because I want eternal life. Because when my time down here on earth is done, I want to know where I'm going. I want to know that everything that I've done, none of it is in vain. But God has something in store for me. God has set up some things in store for me. First, because he loved me. And two, because he desires to have that relationship with us. So, so good times shouldn't be your motivation. Fun shouldn't be your motivation, but life evermore should always be your motivation. And, and then the third characteristics of that narrow gate, if you notice it, and it was blunt when it said this, few actually find it. I, I thought that was really uh, 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 something that was profound when it said, and there are few who actually find the narrow gate. So God is saying there are these two gates here, and I want you to know, that for the most part, most folk are not going to have that gate. Most folks are going to go through the wide and broad gate. And you notice how he describes it. He said they cannot find it. Now, brothers, when I look at that term, can't find it, it almost uh, kind of gives me the, 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 the picture in my mind of people that are looking and searching for something and still can't find it. All right. It, it, it's as though people want something in their lives. 
but they really can't find what they want for various reasons, whether or not when they look at the narrow gate and see how much they have to put in in order to, to go in that direction, to have to walk through that narrow gate, that all of a sudden they can't find what it is they're looking for, and, and this is a little bit easier on people. But what I've come to understand, and it makes so much sense when I read this passage of Scripture, and this part was said it's actually hard for people to find it, it kind of brings some things into context. I believe, brothers and sisters, from every person you can pick, from, from the person that you see in church and, and, and they're there every Sunday to the person that never shows up, really and truly, all people are searching for something. We search for peace. We search for tranquility. We, we, we search uh, for safety. We search for a lot of things. The problem is, is that some people don't end up finding the right thing in their lives. They use substitutes to find that peace. They, they use substitute to find that tranquility. That's how people can get involved and so addicted to things like drugs or alcohol or addicted to other things too that leads to destruction. Uh, not because they said that I wanted to be a bad person, but I'm looking for the things I want so much in the wrong places and we should always be directing them to Jesus Christ. We should always be directing them to the one that can give you lasting peace that the one that can actually give you eternal joy and things that can help you overcome the situations that you're going through right now. People look for answers in the wrong place. And I always say this, misery love company. So you can get with people that, that think like you and all of you all are walking down the Broadway and it's okay because you're having a good time. But truth be told, brothers and sisters, I'd rather have something greater than that. I'd rather have life. I'd rather have eternal life with our Savior, Jesus Christ. I'd rather have a mansion up in glory than a place really down in hell. Because those are the things that's more important to me. So when, when those things are more important to you, watch this. It affects how you live your life down here. The emphasis on things that the world put on down here are less important to you now. Because you have another grander eternal goal on your mind of where you're trying to go. So this passage basically explains, uh, this passage of scripture explains uh, some of the things about the narrow gate and the broad gate. But, but there are some more things too uh, that really kind of speaks to what Jesus Christ was talking about. I, I believe that when you read the word of God, it, it makes sense that when you continue to look at the context of not only just a little scripture, but really the setting and what was being said. Now this, when he talks about this right here in Matthew, the seventh chapter, this is toward the, the ending part of the Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus is talking about this and, and he's talking about the, the, the narrow way and then the broad way. Now watch this. Be careful that you don't just assume or associate and just say, OK, we know the narrow way have people who have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's right. Because the believers are the ones that get through the narrow way. The believers, the one that give themselves over to the Lord, led of God, do what they can and do what thus says the Lord. Yes, those are the ones that get to the narrow way. But here's where we mess up. We mess up because we just normally assume that the wide, broad way is for those people who don't even know God. In other words, I'm saying don't have relationship with God. Don't go to church, hadn't accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. They're just people of the world. But you're about to see some things right now that Jesus is going to explain why this side right here has so much traffic. Because it ain't all what you think it is, brothers and sisters. All right. Let's look at verse number 15 to verse number 20. All right. You'll know by, the, by their fruits. All right. So he's saying, now you got to watch out for some people. Because these are the people now who may think that they have a way to go through the narrow way, but they really don't. Watch this, you all. Verse number 15 says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are like ravenous wolves. My Lord. Now, when you see that, brothers and sisters, <clears throat> first of all, there are a couple of things that should hit you right off. First of all, the use of the word false prophets, which means they're not true prophets, but they're false prophets. And they're spreading things that, not is a that's not a blessing to you, but a hindrance to you. But when I also look at the term, they're actually inwardly a ravenous wolves. It also means that they have a motive to doing all of this. 
They have an agenda why they're doing all of this, and it's to provide for self. All right. When a white ravenous wolf come up on the sheet, he eats the sheep. Why? Because he's hungry and he wants the sheep. So when they prey on somebody, when they prey on believers or anybody else they can get their hands on, it's for them and their benefit and their glory. It does not do anything to elevate, elevate God or Jesus Christ. It's all about them. That's how you know that they're a false prophet, my Lord. All right. Verse number uh, 16. It says, and you will know them by their fruits, my Lord. Now we're going to get down to this. Do men gather grapes? From thorn brushes or figs from thistles? No, they don't. Even so, every good tree bears good fruit. But a bad tree bears bad fruit. My Lord. So now the Bible is saying, okay, if you want to make sure that you're not caught up by these people, these false prophets who are really nothing but ravenous wolves, you judge them by their fruits. All right. Judge them by the fruit that they bear. Judge them whether there's some meekness, gentleness, kindness. Judge them by their fruit because that's the telling thing. If they're good fruit, good fruit is going to show. Those things that I just named, if it's bad fruit, that bad fruit is going to show too as well. My Lord, verse 19 says, every tree that does not bear good fruit, watch this, you all, is cut down and thrown into the fire. My Lord, therefore, by the fruits, you will know them. Why, Lord? So, brothers and sisters, God is saying, look, I have a plan for those bad fruit people. All right. Notice what it said. They, it will be cut down. Every tree that does not bear, bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. That's the destiny of those who are the false prophets, the ravenous wolves, those people who possess the bad fruit. That's their destiny right now. That's a destiny you and I shouldn't want to have, my Lord. But you judge them by their fruit. The fruit will tell you what, what you need to know. So therefore, we need to make sure that we're paying attention to the fruit that we're, that we're seeing. But not only what we're seeing, it also some indication that we need to watch what fruit we're bearing. That's why I said, Lord, work on us so that we are bearing the fruit that you'll have us to bear. We don't want to get caught up like in thinking we're doing right when we're doing wrong. So we're asking God uh, to help us to bear good fruit as well. All right. Now, watch this. Many will think that they're going to make it in this narrow gate. My Lord, think about what I said. I said earlier, if you think this broad, wide gates are just for people on the street that ain't thinking about God, that have ridden God off, and that's all trying to get through this broad gate, they have company, brothers and sisters. All right? Let's look at verse number 21, and we'll go down to verse number 23. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. My Lord. But he that does the will of my father in heaven. Let me share something with you. Um, pastor Chow, and he's not even a pastor anymore. He stopped pastoring his church, had a big, huge mega church, and he decided to go out and to evangelize. And I heard him talk about this some years back. And he talked about it. He said he would read this and it would frighten him, literally frighten him, that there's some people that's not going to make it in the kingdom of God but yet when the people look at them, you would think that they would. That somehow that means, think about what I'm saying now, that somehow you thought them to be a certain way. But yet and still, because God knows the truth in all of us, they end up not making it in. And, and he said he thought about that. He used to fixate on this all the time. And, and, and about this because you never want to be classified as one of those people. All right. Now, we're going to read about some more, and it'll tell you some more. Now, watch this now, because it identifies a lot of things. That was verse number 21. Verse number 22, listen to what they will say in the day of judgment. Watch this. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Now, if I'm reading something and I'm reading about prophesizing, casting out demons and done miracles and wonders, then my mind automatically focuses on people who have a relationship with God. So that kind of identifies the fact, brothers and sisters, you can't put the broad way, the wide way on just folk who are out in the world. But it, that's some folk that's close to brothers and sisters. There's some folk that you see that are part of the church. And they're going to fall under this category, my Lord. 
Let's really read verse number 23. This is the answer when they said, haven't we done this? Haven't we done all of this stuff for you? This is how Christ going to answer. Them. Therefore, it says, watch this. 23 says, and then I would declare to them, I never knew you, my Lord. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. My Lord. That's amazing when you think about it. To be standing there trying to run over your resume, which essentially that's what they're doing. Haven't we done this for you, Lord? Haven't we done this for you? And we did this. And, and we, was, we was there at church every Sunday. And we, we did all of these things. And Christ looks at them and says, depart from me. I never knew you. Brothers and sisters, that's why I say there needs to be some relationship things that go deep down in our, in our heart, in our spirit. Because watch this, you all. It's just not enough to work. You can't work your way into heaven. But that relationship with Jesus Christ, the honesty of your heart, that's what makes the difference. It, 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 it's not projecting yourself to look a certain way so people can believe certain things are you because I about you because I want you to know something God sees through all of that mess he sees our heart he, he knows us better than we know ourselves so so it, it, it's not about doing things for you or me it's about lifting up Jesus Christ and being what he's called us to be and even if it's a struggle because the Bible said the narrow way is difficult it doesn't matter I keep pressing forward I keep trying if I get knocked down I'm gonna get up I'm gonna keep going to him in prayer that there's something about wanting to spend time in glory with our Savior that will motivate me not to give up That'll motivate me, Lord, I need to try a little bit harder because I don't want the alternative. I, I, I don't want to be standing there and hearing the words, depart from me. I never knew you. Brothers and sisters, this speaks of a right relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. No ravenous wolves, no false prophets, but somebody that actually love Christ and they're doing what they're doing, not for the benefit of themselves, but they just want to spread Jesus. They just want to see folks saved. They just want to be a blessing to someone. There's no other accolades that motivate them to doing stuff. I'm not doing it for you to pack me on the back. That should be our attitude. I'm doing it so Christ can say servant well done. That should all be our motivation right there. My Lord. Brothers and sisters, briefly turn with me to Romans 10th chapter. Romans the 10th chapter. We'll be done in just a minute. Romans the 10th chapter, and we'll look at verses 1 and 3, okay? All right? So here's the problem. What, how do people come into this being a part of this category that I just read? How, it's so easy. It's, it's part of, uh, of getting caught up in self, of having the wrong motivation in your heart. But I want you to look at me with this. Romans 10, chapter, verse 1 says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. Verse number 2, for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant to God's righteousness and seeking, watch this, to establish their own righteousness and have not submitted to the righteousness of God. In other words, they had a zeal for God. They wanted to be what God called them to, called them to be, but self got in the way. That's how you can end up being a false prophet or, or, or having the wrong motivation because self got in the way. And instead of God's righteousness, it ended up being self-righteousness. My Lord, one more thing I want to say to bring this home. I want you to turn back with me to Matthew, but we're going to the 10th chapter. These are ways, these are how you can characterize, be characterized in this sense. And all of a sudden you would think, Lord, haven't I done this and haven't do that, done that? And why am I not making it in? Because of your heart. Because of the motivation that's truly down on the inside. These scriptures are just going to bear witness to this, brothers and sisters. So let's look at Matthew chapter 10. Let's read verses 34 through 39. It says, and I want you to listen to this, because these are words of Jesus Christ. And at times it might seem harsh, but it's driving home the point of what he expects for us. And there's a lot of knowledge in this script, in this text right here. All right. So Matthew 10, verse number 34 says, do not think that I've came to bring peace on earth. This is Christ. 
I did not come to bring peace, but a sword, my Lord. Mm. For I've come, watch this, to set man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Verse 36, and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. Now, when you hear Jesus say this, this seems very harsh, all right? So what is he saying? He said, I'm not here to bring peace, but a sword. Watch this. Jesus understood that we are under spiritual warfare. That there are things that we battle against and fight against that's not visible to our natural eyes, but there is a spiritual war that's taking place. It does not stop. There is no ceasefire for a couple of months. You wake up in the spiritual warfare. You go to sleep. There's spiritual warfare. While you're asleep, God protects you because there are spiritual warfare that's over you that seeks your destruction. And God understands that if we're going to have to have change in our lives, we're going to have to step out on faith. And sometimes that means stepping out against people that's close to us, especially when they're not where God wants them to be, my Lord. God is doing a mighty work on you. And in order for him to do the mighty work on you to perform the task that God has required of you, you're going to have to make a sacrifice. I'm going to have to make a sacrifice to do what thus says the Lord. My Lord, this is harsh what God is saying, but it makes perfect sense. Watch this. Verse 37. He who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So now all of this scripture is now beginning to get some context to it. Look at what it says. He says, watch this. I'm not saying you can't love your mother or father. I cannot, I'm not saying you can't love your family. But in the grand scheme of everything that I've designed or done, there should be nobody in your life above me. And when you allow other people to be above me, I can't really use you. You're not really good for nothing because in order to be with me, in order to have that relationship with me, it's going to take some denial on your part and it's going to take some sacrifice, my Lord. And let's add some more and, and some obedience. This is what God is saying. So when he named those things as harsh as it seemed, as though he's saying that he, he wanted people to be at it with people they love. No, that's not what he's saying. But he is saying that if you're going to be with me, you're going to have to sacrifice. There's some folk that you're literally going to have to say no to, to do the will of God. Here's what I understand when I read this, this, this passage of scripture, brothers and sisters, <clears throat> and it blows my mind. Sometimes our battles are not really on the outside with the world. Sometimes your greatest battle is in your house with people that you know. Sometimes the greatest thing that brings you pain is not somebody on your job or nowhere else, but it's somebody you see every day wake up to and say good morning. Sometimes it's the very people that's close to us that are really causing us not to be or to do what God has called us to do. Yeah, sometimes it gets to that point. And Jesus makes that known right here in this passage of scripture. My Lord. So he says that now, verse number 38 says, and he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. There it is right there. This whole thing is about denial, denial of self and following Christ. And here's what we have not come to to really understand. To follow Christ, the only way you can do it properly is that self has to be denied. There's no way for you to fully follow Christ and still hold on to self. It, it, I want you to think about it. Think about it as a seesaw. You know how a seesaw is, right? One goes up. When that side goes up, the other goes down. When one side goes up, the other goes down. When following Christ goes up, denial has to come down. And there have been people, brothers and sisters, who in a strange way of thinking can some, somehow believe that I can follow Christ, but yet I don't have to deny myself like I need to. And, and somehow I can do both and balance it out. You can't balance and you can't serve two masters, first of all. All right. You can't walk the fence when it comes to Jesus Christ. These things are connected. Your following and relationship with him goes up when the denial part goes down. My Lord. Verse number uh, uh, 39 said, he who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Brothers and sisters, there are some things that have tugged for your attention. Things that you got caught up with that you knew in your heart. Lord, I know I need to let this go. 
but I just can't right now. And, and Christ is saying, die to those things. You die to those things and you'll find life. You'll die to sin and you'll find glory. You, you die to the things of this world and you'll find the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are some things you literally got to die to in order that you may have life. Brothers and sisters, there are two ways to go. One is a broad, wide way that it seems like everybody, a, a lot of people trying to go down. And here's a narrow way that Christ wants us to strive for. But let me give you fair warning. That narrow way ain't going to be easy. Christ said it. It's going to be downright difficult sometimes. But don't you give up. Don't you not believe that you can't do it. The scripture was emphatic when it says we can do all things through Jesus Christ that strengthens us. God said it and it's so. You can do everything through Jesus Christ that strengthens you. And that is also getting through the narrow gate. There's going to have to be some self-denial. There's going to have to be some prioritizing, some following Jesus Christ. But with him, all things are possible. All you have to do is watch this, believe, and then step forward and put, let your actions speak for the faith that God has placed in you. My Lord, thank God. We pray that you've been blessed with our midweek Bible study. God is continuing to do a great thing in all of us. Let us continue to be in prayer for one another. Continue to hold up one another that we serve a great and able God. We look forward to seeing you again this Sunday at 10 o'clock on our Sunday uh, worship service broadcast. God will have a, a mighty word for you then. I will continue to be in prayer and don't you ever give up. Amen. Goodbye.